Our friend from Sports Illustrated is back here on the Rich Eisen Show, Albert Breer. How are you doing, Albert? I'm good. What was the question there? The question like is, I, based on the, the story du jour, is which sports moment would you want to have eclipsed out of your memory banks if you could choose just one? And I, like I, I guess the one I want to get rid of? Yes. You're saying? Yep. Yep. Blocked out. Um, Full totality out of your memory banks. Full totality moment. out of my memory banks. Um, Florida, Ohio State, 2007. Okay. Oh. I went. Mad. I have never. I have never been more confident in a team than I was in the 07 Buckeyes, and that was the one two. That was the year the one two game with Michigan, the day after Bo died or two days after Bo died. Right. And that team, I again, I've never been more confident in a, in, a, in a team than I was that I root for than I was in that team. And that team. As skeptical as I've always been as a sports fan, that's like prevented me from ever being like fully optimistic ever again. <laughs> wow, that's a scarring one. I I, I was going to guess it would be Miami, Ohio State. That would be the one. Oh, would I want to get rid of that? That was a great memory. That was phenomenal. Okay, all right. Just wanted to you know, figure too? out. Oh, Miami got screwed. Oh, Miami got screwed. Miami's that the one. one. That oh, okay, that's Miami right. didn't get screwed. That was a good call. I mean, kudos hey, to the official. Hey, for that flag. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> just, he just, it just took him a little while to fish it out of his pocket. That's all. Uh, it was where is that crazy. thing? Hold on. A oh, <laughs> there it is. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Albert, you're reporting on why the Bills sent Stephon Diggs to the Texans when it would have cost them $3 million less on the cap to keep him is what? Yeah, so a couple things. I, I think the first thing is the obvious, which, you know, like it has been sort of an annual thing that they've, you know, dealt with some drama off the field. And I think going through the thing in mini camp um, last year is not a non factor. So there is the thought that eventually you're going to have to move past all of that. And um, so that's there. I think the bigger thing is that the, I would never say the door. The, the, the window of opportunity is closed. The window of championship opportunity is closed on a team that's got a quarterback like Josh Allen. But I think with each of these quarterbacks, you have like little eras within their bigger era. And the first era for Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean and building around Josh Allen was drawing to a close. Um, a lot of guys had gotten into their 30s. Some guys had had injury issues. It just, I think, towards the end of last year, you could tell that that group was sort of on fumes. And so you saw earlier this offseason, they're starting to offload some of those guys. Micah Hyde, um, Jordan Poyer, Tredavious White, Mitch Morse, um, guys who were cornerstones for them that were such a big part of building the Bills into what they've been over the last six, seven years. And so when you're looking at this as Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, it's okay, so we can either do this in phases where we get rid of those guys this year and then maybe Stefan Diggs next year and we're dealing with the ramifications of both in two different years or we can do it all at once. And in that way, I think it's sort of, um, you can draw a comparison to what the Rams did last year when they offloaded Jalen Ramsey and Leonard Floyd, a bunch of other people. They made the conscious decision then, the Rams did, that um, if we don't do this now, um, then this is going to be a multi-year process. And so do we want to do it in one year? Do we want to do it over a couple of years? And they made the decision they wanted to do it all at once. And because they got great coaching, great quarterback play, and great drafting and finding guys like Kobe Turner and Puka Nakua and, and Byron Young, they were able to make the playoffs in their reset year. So that's sort of where the Bills are now is they're in a full reset year. It doesn't mean they can't win, but they have to get great coaching, great quarterbacking, and great drafting to get through it. And um, so I think all of that added up to, you know, like this being the time to do it, especially when you consider the value they got back and um, getting what was the rough equivalent of a low second round pick. You know, I know that sounds like not much for a really great player, um, but the reality of it was if they waited any longer, there was no guarantee that they were even going to be able to get that going forward. So I think you kind of meld all those things together and you say, okay, you know, we're going to go through a reset year in 2024 and we'll have clean financials and a much younger team in 2025 going forward to sort of, you know, launch Josh Allen 2.0 in Buffalo. So, and again, this is not me searching for low hanging fruit. And clearly in our business, when a quarterback and an, uh, a Pro Bowl top notch wide receiver um, are rumored to be having a falling out, we're, we're constantly hunting and pecking for the yep. for the answer. And it's been it's been a couple of years running, actually, yeah. with these two guys. So. There, there's no there there 
on that front. It's just all I mean, an economic I, I, I decision. Jo- Albert? I think Josh and Steph are fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I know they kept Josh up to date on that. I think over the last month or so, um, this deal was first discussed over a month ago, Rich. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a result of them putting Steph on Diggs on the trade market. It sort of is the same as when, um, you know, when Diggs was traded from Minnesota Buffalo. That was all sparked by a tweet. You know, like Stefan Diggs, I can't remember exactly what it was he tweeted, but he tweeted something on the day he was traded in Minnesota, which prompted Brandon Bean, the Buffalo general manager, to pick up the phone and call the Vikings and ask if he was available. Sort of the same thing here, you know, with a couple of teams had um, had looked at the situation and said, I wonder if there's an opportunity there for us to go get Stefan Diggs. One of those teams was Houston. And that conversation started, you know, over a month ago now. And, you know, Nick Casario kind of stuck with it and they kept working on it and working on it and working on it. And as Buffalo's situation evolved over the last, you know, four, five, six weeks where it was clear that, you know, they were going to be in this, you know, youth movement, this this phase where they were going to be retooling a little bit. And they got through their receiver evaluations. And this is a receiver group that's both really strong at the top and deep in the draft. Um, you know, they kind of get to the point where they say, okay, like, you know, like this is the time to do it again. I don't think things are perfect between Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs, but I know that they've had a, a pretty close relationship, a pretty respectful relationship over the years, their competitiveness, the two of them could get the best of them at times, but I, I don't think that this is like Josh Allen picking up the phone and saying, get this guy out of town. Okay. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And so what's the Genesis or the story behind the way the Texans, uh, handled Diggs's contract as soon as he was on their team, where you, they wiped yeah. out a bunch of years, and he's essentially on a walk year right now. What's why do that? Yeah, I think it's a good faith thing. Um, you know, I think it's a good faith thing in saying like we'd love to have a longer term relationship with you, um, but you know, like for right now, um, you know, like you know, like let's work through this. And and I think Diggs had the motivation to maybe get one more bite of the financial apple, and this allows him to go and do that. It's going to be very difficult for the Texans to franchise him based on what that number will be in, in, in 2025. And so, you know, Stefan Diggs effectively has a free way to free agency now, which gives him great bargaining power. Um, he's 30 years old. So, you know, is the way last year ended, is that a harbinger that, you know, things, you know, like might be going in the wrong direction It's possible. You know, that's what happens sometimes with older receivers. Um, but I think it does, you know, give the Texans a chance to get a very motivated Stefan Diggs. Not that he wouldn't be otherwise, um, because of how competitive he is. Um, and you know, if you look at where the Texans are financially too, uh, you know, after the, you know, they're going to be looking at paying Nico Collins after this year. And then, you know, obviously down the line budgeting for Will Anderson and, and CJ Stroud. And so they're going to have some bigger numbers coming down the pike, you know, over the next few years. Uh, but they have this opportunity now while C.J. Stroud's on a rookie contract and Will Anderson's on a rookie contract. And so I view it as them taking advantage of that and sort of keeping themselves loose financially going forward where they have Stefan Diggs coming in on a one-year deal. doesn't mean he won't re-sign after the year, but he's in on a one-year deal. And they have Daniil Hunter coming over from the Vikings to play opposite Will Anderson on a two-year deal. Um, you know, very much targets like the next couple of years as 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 the time to take advantage of having CJ Stroud on a rookie contract. And then lastly for you, because you're you're the Maven here in terms of uh, ear to the ground trends and what uh, general managers and the rest of the league is looking at position groups and how to put rosters together. Um, the, the Chargers also let two of their top receivers walk, yep. one in a trade, one in walk in for their stud rec- uh, quarterback and his second contract. So uh, I'm just wondering, are, are we seeing the receiver position viewed more like a running back spot yeah. where, where, where let's go get some in the draft. Look at the, the, the Packers, what they did with a bunch of guys who were $11 million collectively on the cap. Yeah. I had Ross Tucker here in our number two. He said, look at the chiefs. They've gone back to back after trading away mm-hmm. Tyree Keller. Are we seeing uh, a trend here? Albert? If you want to get super big picture with it, Rich, sure. which I know, you know, you don't mind that, right? Yeah. If you want to get super big picture with this. This is the way the sport's going. I mean, that's where the best best athletes are playing. It seems like, I mean, it, I, and you cover this draft as cover the draft as closely as anybody on a year to year basis. It's like every year is a great receiver year, and they're always second and third round picks to be dug out. You know, um, think about Amon Amon Ross St. Brown in Detroit and Nico Collins in Houston, like. 
these are guys who are non first round picks, you know, so there's not only the great like freak guys at the top and you have three of those this year and, and Harrison and Dunze and neighbors, but there's also depth all over the place. And so I, I think it's a little different than um, running back with running back. It's more, you're going to get the best value for them while they're on their rookie contracts. And obviously they age much faster than the other positions. And it is an easier position to fill. Um, I think with the receiver, it's more, it's so it's become replaceable because there's so many great ones. Cause that's where all the great athletes in the sport are gravitating because of the passing game, because of seven on seven. In fact, if you want to go like a low, a level deeper on this, have you noticed over the last few years, how so many of the top corners are sons of NFL players? Um, you know, Patrick Sertan, Asante Samuel Jr. Um, you know, JC Horn is, is, is Joe Horn's kid there in Carolina. Um, you know, Stingley, um, you know, Derek Stingley is Daryl Stingley's grandson. Why do you think that is? It's because their dads are looking at it and saying, there are so many kids who are six foot one, six foot two, 200 pounds that can really run playing receiver. Go play, go play corner kid, you know? And so I think that there's like a bigger picture thing ha here happening at the receiver position. And certainly for the chargers, if you look at it, what's harder to replace Keenan Allen and Mike Williams or Joey Bosa and Cleo Mack. <laughs> I'd say it's much harder to replace the edge rushers because there are less of those guys out there. So I didn't mean to take that to a place that maybe no, no, no. he didn't intend no, no, to take no, no. it, you're, but you're right. I think it's like, I think it's a big picture thing that starts when these kids are 13, 14, 15 years old, like Odell Beckham, maybe he's Marshall Falk a generation ago. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of cases like that in football now. Yeah. I mean, and we, we didn't mention Joey Porter's kid too, right? There's, yeah. an, there's another one for you yep. right there. Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen show in your MMQB that you posted today, you talked about the Michael Penix conundrum. What is that right now? So like I, I if if you want to go back to like the fall and you know I ask around about the quarterbacks in particular during the fall cuz I like to have that perspective um you know with scouts guys who are on the road um I've felt for a long time like um like the the NFL wasn't as high on Michael Penix as 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 the general public was and so you know I really went into all this thinking maybe he's a second round pick maybe he's a third round pick like that like people would catch up to kind of how the NFL views him. And, you know, one of the reasons why was um, right before the championship game, I, you know, I asked a bunch of scouts about both McCarthy and Penix to try to get, you know, a read on how they saw them. And, you know, one of the scouts called him a three point shooter. Um, and that like, he's unbelievable down the field, like really, really great accuracy down the field, but he's not great. And it's a weird thing that they have a hard time explaining, but he wasn't great underneath, you know, with the short to intermediate stuff. And so, you know, as I asked around, that kind of kept coming up. And then I see what Jesse Minter and Michigan did to him in the championship game. They basically, and Rich, you watched it closely, like they dared him to go underneath. They dared him to go on 10, 12 play drives and they couldn't do it. And so, like, I think that that was sort of the rep that scouts, you know, saw like that, that was the rep that he had with scouts over the course of the last couple of years. What's fascinating about this now, and this is what I call the conundrum is as I've made more calls over the last couple of weeks, I've found that coaches love him hmm. and that coaches like him a lot more than scouts do. And so I was talking to somebody over the weekend who, you know, knows Penix and I asked, why would that be? And it was really interesting. The answer I got was that Penix has the stuff that you can't coach. The downfield accuracy is very, very difficult to correct or grow. It's just either there or it's not. Michael Penix throws with anticipation. That's really, really hard to coach. Um, where he struggles, like underneath, like coaches feel like they can fix that. Where he struggles with movement in the pocket, coaches feel like they can work on that. So I think that that's the conundrum is that, you know, in some of these draft rooms, you're going to have coaches that really, really like him. Like I had a couple of coaches tell me that they thought he was the second best quarterback in the entire draft behind Caleb Williams, which stunned me based on where scouts were putting him over the last three or four months. So I think that that's where it's going to be really interesting to see the way these things are kind of worked through over the next couple of weeks in these draft rooms where there could be some disagreement on Michael Penix Jr. So then now that we're, I mean, rubber's meeting the road, sir, you know, I mean, yep. we're 17 days out from the draft now. Yep. I mean, top 50 visits are, are going to end very mm -hmm. shortly. And I mean, man, we're in master's week. This is it. Like this yeah. is time here. So uh, your best guess, do you think we're going to see four quarterbacks top of the draft? Albert, what do you think? I think four. You, you mean one, two, three, four? Yes, sir. In the row. We start with four, okay, so, I, four quarterbacks in a row. Okay. I think 
I think if New England takes Drake May at three, then yes. Um, I think either Minnesota or New England takes Drake May at three. That would be my guess right now. And I, I know that sounds a little weird, um, but I think Minnesota would move up with New England. And if New England has Drake May and J.J. McCarthy equal or has, say, J.J. a little over or even way over Drake, well, then I think New England would look at the – look at the board and say, could we trade down and then trade back up? Sort of like what Arizona did last year, mm -hmm. right? Like where, you know, Monty Austin for first year GM there would have taken Paris Johnson third overall moves down to 11 in that trade with Houston. So Houston can go up and get Will Anderson. And then they wind up turning back around and trading back up to six and get the guy they would have taken at three in Paris Johnson, along with all the extra draft capital that came with that. Um, I could see New England doing something like that, or maybe somebody else comes up to get J.J. McCarthy at four. So I think the scenario where it's one, two, three, four might be New England takes Drake May, sits at three, takes Drake May at three, and then somebody comes up with Arizona, maybe Minnesota, to get McCarthy at four. Um, if, if again, McCarthy goes, if, if, um, if Minnesota comes up to get May, at three, then maybe the same urgency to get up doesn't exist because Minnesota is now off the board as a trade partner. And maybe New England, you know, pits four, five, and six against each other to go up and get McCarthy. Um, I know that's complicated. No, no. So it's a angle there. But uh, but I think that there's that sort of game of poker that could happen on draft. So weekend. how do we not get four in a row to start then? Uh, New England does yeah. what? Like they they so, they go so, Mar so Marvin say, Harrison instead of a quarterback, so, or because they think they can get Knicks or Penix another spot. I mean, like, right. So like I think that there's like the there maybe is this um you know like this there's all these connections out there, right? Like so a lot of people have connected, um, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Jaden Daniels to the Raiders because of Antonio Pierce. Yes. Well, there's the same sort of connections with Minnesota and Drake May. Josh McCown coached Drake May in high school. Josh McCown's son played with Drake May. Um, at high school there in Charlotte. So, and there's a really good rapport between May and the Viking staff. Now, I can't say whether or not that means they're going to go over the top and offer both first round picks this year and a first round pick next year to go up and get Drake May. But, you know, if that were to happen, then I think maybe that lessens the urgency again because Minnesota is not part of the equation anymore. Um, to move up and get JJ McCarthy, and so but the Giants are sitting maybe, there at six, though. You know what I mean? Maybe the Giants sit. Maybe the Giants sit and take him at six. Maybe instead of going up to four, the Patriots say we're going up to five. Uh, maybe the Patriots offer to get up to four because they don't have the two current first year, uh, first round two two current year first round picks. Maybe their offer to go up to to four isn't what Arizona would want. Maybe Arizona sits and takes Marvin Harrison or somebody else there. And then, and then you got the Bron I, you also have the Broncos too. Broncos, man. I yeah. Mean, yeah. It, and I think the Broncos like I think J I mean you know this. Like I think yeah, JJ no. McCarthy stylistically fits Sean Payton. Right. You know? Yes. So like I do but think But he's not like, gonna be he's not gonna be there at twelve, sir. I don't think No, I know, I know. And that's what I'm saying is like I you know, we're all prisoners to our history, right? Well part of it was Sean Payton is you know and i can tell you this like the sting of 2017 still sits with sean payton and what he went through in 2017 when he genuinely loved patrick mahomes when not a lot of other people did and they were sitting there at 11 and andy reed his old buddy jumps him and you know trades <laughs> up from 27 to 10 and steals patrick mahomes like that kind of thing sits in a guy's head you know and so sean payton and i can't say one way or another whether or not he loves anybody even close to as much as he loved Mahomes in 2017. But if he does, I think the sting of having gone through that would prompt him to want to really get aggressive and move up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there are all kinds of interesting kind of machinations at play here. And I mean, I can tell you, you know, you have the teams in the top three and then no less than four teams in the top 13 have, really looked at the idea of going up and uh, going up for a quarterback. The Giants at six, the Vikings at 11, um, the Broncos at 12, and then the Raiders at 13. So um, there certainly could be competition to move up, no question. Albert, you're the man. Thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate Absolutely. it. Uh, again, we'll have you on before the draft, too. And Absolutely. I, I, right. Well, and I'll see you in Detroit for sure, right? You'll you'll be in Detroit. I don't know if I'm going to be in Detroit. We'll see. Might be too many Wolverines oh. there for me. Was it? Oh. Oh. Come on. You guys Albert. have so many nice coincidences. The, Look the, the, at this the, guy. The I was ready to just to say Detroit. goodbye Jeez. to him and not bring up the fact that he's like, oh, I wanted Coach Cal at Ohio State, but we couldn't afford him to keep our NIL program together for 
football. Ooh. And I've been like, what does that mean? So priorities, you, priorities no, 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 is what I mean. No, the thirteen million dollar team. We're gonna have to see or them football down in school, November, Rich. In November, we've never we've never run from that. We're more like chicken money. The thirteen million dollar kids gonna welcome Michigan yeah. into the see, horseshoe. When we have, we, We'll when we when we have a when we have a downturn in football, we don't pretend to be a bit basketball school like some other places. We're a football school. <laughs> I, I won't run from that. All That's right, there. Yeah, all right, a little bit of uh, fi- let's funny. just say this: uh, the eclipse isn't the only fireworks. Good to see. You. That's right. All That's right, right, Albert. Great to see you, Rich. All right, the man, Albert Breer. Check out the MMQB at the MMQB, obviously, but. Uh, Albert Breer is a must-follow. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.